Hello, and thank you for joining us on our 2023 Hurricane Preparedness Webinar. We're going to be discussing on how to protect your business and your family. But first, let's take a moment to review some legal considerations. So the agenda for today's discussion is really three things, knowing your risk, which would include expectations and also insurance considerations, how to prepare your business, including your people, your property and operations. And then we're gonna share some lessons learned as well as some BRP resources. Some of those lessons learned are really around proper planning, which is maybe the most important takeaway from this presentation, and then how to successfully recover, which will give you and your business a competitive advantage. Our speakers today are myself, Tim Liberty. I'm a Director of Risk Mitigation Services with BKS Partners. Jill King is also a Director of Risk Mitigation Services with our INS Group. Steve Dodge is our National Director of Claims Advocacy with Baldwin Risk Partners. Patrick Kirby is our Senior Director of National Risk Mitigation Services, also with Baldwin Risk Partners. And Laura Noterer, Private Risk Advisor with BKS Partners. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Jill King to talk about knowing your risk. Jill? Thank you, Tim. Um, today I'm going to talk about knowing your risk, what to expect, and then we're going to speak a little bit about insurance considerations. So I know most of you are familiar with the Saffir Simpson hurricane scale. Um, it's designed to give us ratings on what expected damage could be um, in a hurricane. Uh, I'd like to point out here, of course, the hurricane cat category number four and five. Um, Hurricane Ian, which we'll discuss in a moment, came in um, as a Cat 5, uh, but landed uh, at a Cat 4. Again, we can see beach homes flooded, homes destroyed. And then also with Hurricane Harvey, uh, we're going to talk about that. And it came in also at a Cat 4. Um, Part of knowing your risk is knowing where the most vulnerable U.S. locations are. Florida and Texas, both on the storm surge and then likely to be hit by a major hurricane. Um, Southeast Florida and Southeast Texas uh, seem to take the prize. Storm surge is something that, you know, besides the wind damage um, that we saw before from a hurricane, you know, storm surge is the abnormal rise in seawater during a storm. It's measured basically by the height above the normal predicted um, astronomical table. And then it's caused primarily, again, by the storm winds that push the water on shore. So again, we see Florida, uh, Central Texas, um, and uh, South Texas as the most likely. So here we're going to talk about the two hurricanes that I mentioned before, Hurricane Harvey in 2017. That was a tremendous amount of storm surge um, that came into the Southeast Texas area. Wasn't so much a wind event. As you can see, the levees couldn't contain the amount of rainfall. Um, house were damaged both inside and outside. And what was so much impactful of Hurricane Harvey is that these were out of the official floodplains. 80% um, of Harvey victims did not have flood insurance, um, again, because of the surge and because of the amount of rain uh, that came in uh, because of it. And then most recently, uh, last December of 2022, Hurricane Ian landed, as mentioned before, as a Cat 4 on the Florida Southwest Coast. Again, severe damage from that storm surge uh, came up several miles um, inland with the rivers. There was severe flooding, heavy property damage, and unfortunately, 160 people lost their lives mainly to drowning. So the present state of the levees and dams um, in the United States, Florida has nearly 700 miles, Texas 1,800. Um, half of the dams in the US are privately owned. And unfortunately, many are at risk or in need of repair. Um, we're growing um, in the states. Our population has boomed. And it gives us all a false sense of security. Um, I would like to mention that in the Texas area, uh, there is a billion-dollar state levy project from the Sabine Pass to Galveston Bay uh, that is being worked on now. Um, and uh, that will certainly help. Um, the storm surge down in Southeast Texas. 
So now we wanna talk about protecting yourself from risk um, to protect yourself from, from these type of risks. First, you need to understand the financial strength of your insurer. Insurance companies are rated um, and they have a rating that shows how capable they are of paying the claims that are presented to them. Um, and this is an important thing. This is also an important thing that BRP and their partners watch uh, every day um, in working with our carrier partners. You certainly wanna work with the right insurance advisor. You want to make sure that your advisor um, understands your business and understands your needs and what's important to protect you uh, from storms and any kind of, of peril that may come. Include your insurer's toll-free claims number and your broker's name in your emergency kit. It becomes very helpful when there's no power or your cell phone's out and all your numbers are stored in the phone. Uh, review your wind and flood cost benefit analysis annually. If again, you're working with the right insurance advisor, you will be doing that um, with them. And then most importantly, um, understand your policy contract. And simply that's reading your contract. Again, reach out to your broker partner, Make sure your asset values are correct. Your wind hail versus hurricane deductible are proper. Do you have a requirement to repair or replace? What are your landscaping limitations? And here we are going to talk about the hurricane deductible. Um, 19 states in the District of Columbia have hurricane deductibles. And a hurricane deductible it depends on how it's regulated. Um, within your state. Dependent upon your state and insurance company, you may pay per storm, per season, per calendar year. And usually your hurricane deductible is a percentage of the total insured value, your TIV. And an example would be 5% hurricane deductible on a 1 million TIV, your total insured value is 50,000. And typically this is an annual deductible and this could be considered for multiple storms. But most importantly, uh, we want to uh, make sure and inform you um, of what is more relevant for you in the states that you are doing business. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Pat Kirby who's gonna talk about preparing your business. Thank you, Jill, for the great information um, and for that segue into preparing your business. So when you think about a hurricane or a cat event, um, there's some business considerations um, that you should be taking um, into account. And it kind of all starts with the question, are you truly prepared? Um, just some relevant information is the estimated dollar value of lost business activity as a result of like Hurricane Sandy was $25 billion. Uh, and that happened up on the Northeast coast. Um, Almost 40% of small businesses never reopen their doors following a disaster. And it's just because of a few, sometimes a few inches of water that causes tens of thousands of dollars uh, to your property. Keep in mind that planning ahead can save thousands of dollars in lost revenue due to structural damage or content damage, interruption um, of business operations, or just your employee displacement who um, you know, your employees may not be there at a time when they need to be. And it can also be an opportunity to increase revenue and build brand loyalty. So we'll talk about those things um, in, the, um, in the ensuing slides here. But I want to, you to pay particular attention um, to the three main areas um, of emergency preparation and response. We should be addressing people, property, and our operations. And as a last resort, um, kind of the foundation of those three when things really go awry is your insurance policy. So let's start with people uh, preparation and response. Um, and I'm gonna kind of start at the bottom of this slide and talk a little bit about what we should be considering prior to a storm, during and after a storm. So prior to a storm, we should be prepping the building. We should be identifying potential secondary business locations where we can, um, conduct business after a storm in case our primary location is inaccessible or damaged. 
Uh, we should be reaching out and contacting clients and vendors um, as well. During a storm, we should be monitoring our property if it's safe to do so, monitoring the storm and disseminating any pertinent news and instructions to our employees and our clients. And then after, we should be taking a look at an operations assessment, contacting clients and vendors, and then resuming or making plans to resume our operations. So some of the key pieces of that preparation and response, response is to establish communication and procedures and, and protocols ahead of time and conduct employee condition assessments um, ahead of time to monitor their welfare and status um, during or after the storm. And then determining who will, who will need to carry out preparations in response. So it's a very good idea to categorize, categorize your employees based on um, your needs prior to, during, and after a storm and educate them on a, having a personal hurricane plan. One of, the, one of the things I'd like to mention about a personal hurricane plan is if you've identified your employees that need to be there, they're critical for reopening your business after a cat, after a cat event or a hurricane, we really need to make sure they have their own plan so they're actually available to be able to come in and help the business reopen. Um, all right, continuing on with people and talking about preparation and response, how many of us want to pause in our ability to pay our employees? If the business is not in operation or will not be for a period of time, will we pay our employees anyway, even if they are not working? And if and for how long? Can they use sick days? Will they require? Um, will we require them to use uh, things like vacation days or PTO? All of this should be decided upon and communicated prior to a storm. And what about employees' obligations to the business? I talked about that a little bit on the previous slide. Have we defined and have we defined what those obligations are and what they're required to do? Will we provide our employees with any uh, assistance like food, water, clothing? fuel, uh, baby formula. Remember, many employees could be without power uh, for extended periods of time and limited access to these necessities. And sometimes businesses have the means to help them. And it's in our best interest, not to just help other people, but also it's in our best interest to help others that may be able to come in and help us uh, reopen, our, reopen our operations. In addition to that, uh, if you decide to do many of those things, you want to obtain fresh emergency supplies for your employees, not only at the a business location itself, um, but potentially give out hurricane packets to your employees at, uh, ahead of time for home use. And then once you've established some of these communication protocols and emergency policies and procedures like call trees or operations and damage assessments um, or backup operations, it's a good idea to practice those and do some tabletop exercises um, with yourself and your employees. So now I'm going to hand the presentation over to Tim Liberty, our Director of Risk Mitigation Services at BKS Partners, who will talk to you about property. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, so I'm going to take a little bit more in-depth look at preparing your property. The first step is to know the vulnerability of your business. Each business is different and may present some unique obstacles. That could be your location. You might be in a, a flood-prone area or maybe you're relying on subcontractors and vendors, you gotta think, are they prepared for a catastrophic event? Is your employee base located in vulnerable areas? And will they be able to get back to work quickly post-storm or post-catastrophic event? Maybe you have a fleet of vehicles, think where they're located, will you have access to them post-storm? Maybe you're located on an island where there's a bridge is the only way on or off the property. We saw a few bridges in the past collapse making recovery really, really difficult for homeowners and businesses. Then you have your equipment. I highly recommend that you take time to list all of your major equipments and furnishings. That includes make and models and serial numbers. And I'd also recommend uh, taking either video or photos of them as well. This will make the claims process much, much easier. Most important thing you can do though, is to have a plan. Have a plan to mitigate the damage to your property, uh, which I'll get to more in, in the next few slides but have a plan to recover and get back in business quickly post-storm. This can create an enormous competitive advantage by being the first business to open your doors after a catastrophic event. We saw some clients in the past who had the best years in their history during, 
right after a catastrophic event because they did a great job of planning and they were the first ones to open their doors or they adapted their business models to meet the needs of their community. And I'll share some examples in the lessons learned section in a few minutes. All right, on this slide, we have some tips to get your property ready for a hurricane. The most important takeaway though, is to do these things safely. Don't send someone onto a roof it isn't, if it isn't a flat roof or if they don't have the ability to tie off. We don't want our employees getting injured prior to a storm or ever really. But if it is safe to do so, have someone clear the gutters and as well as the roof of any debris. The idea of our gutters is to make sure that water is flowing properly away from our buildings. Same thing for satellite dishes and other equipment. Go, if we can get to the rooftop safely, make sure it's secured down correctly. Remove any loose material around your property that might turn into a flying object. Clear any branches and also potted plants from your building as well, because those could be thrown up by the storm as well. Uh, if you can, board up your windows and sandbag your doors, including your garage doors prior to the storm as well to keep water from coming in. Now let's look at the inside of the property. You have to think of your valuable equipment and you wanna move those those items away from the windows and also as high off the ground as possible. Things like computer and some desks, things like that, make sure those are up and also make sure they're unplugged. Some other steps to take is to make sure whatever way you're monitoring the storm, make sure it's operating efficiently and effectively. Check your battery powered equipment and supplies to make sure that they're juiced up. Now, if you do have damage to your property, you're gonna to wanna to make sure to secure it as best you can to avoid any trespassing or looting. So have signage available as well as some temporary fencing. Identify restorations and security vendors as well. This is gonna be one of the key takeaways from the presentation is having these contacts with uh, these type of companies is incredibly important in getting best results. Any hurricane is gonna bring a lot of property claims to an area and remediation companies um, are gonna be inundated with calls. The better relationship you have with a remediation company, the more likely it is that you're going to receive preferential treatment. Now, some of these companies may require a written, written agreement ahead of time uh, in order to be put on that priority list. If that's the case, make sure you read it thoroughly, research the firm, and make sure that they are reputable and run that agreement by legal counsel. Many of these companies offer pre-loss assistance, such as boarding windows and sandbagging as well. So it's really important to, to incorporate them into your pre-loss and your recovery plans. All right, now I'm gonna hand it over to Steve Dodge, who's gonna discuss proper recovery. Steve? Thanks, Tim. At this point, I'm gonna pivot our discussion to some key areas of focus, along with tips, reminders, and strategies to assist with property recovery, as well as your operational preparations and response. For property recovery, you'll first need to complete a post-storm damage assessment. A point person should be assigned to lead your recovery efforts. That point person will be your quarterback to help you navigate communication and information sharing between the key internal and external partners. First priority is to evaluate the ability to safely re-enter the property. If there are any concerns around, around potentially dangerous conditions, you should notify the local authorities immediately. Some examples of those conditions might be any downed power lines, submerged electrical components, and if the structure of the building appears to be impaired at any level. You will need to communicate these appropriate restrictions or if you need to eliminate access to the property while further assessment by the appropriate experts are completed. It is also key to remember Early reporting of the damage to your broker or insurer is needed to begin engagement with your partners to aid with resources needed for remediation and restoration efforts. After the broker and insurer are on notice, you will work with your partners to ensure that you have the appropriate recovery strategy. If needed, notify and procure a secure security company. They can assist to provide oversight and protection to your assets and property that might be exposed during this recovery process. Notifying your vendors of needed repairs for them to evaluate the scope of loss and remediation efforts needed for your recovery. Working with your partners to establish a timeline to complete repairs. 
This timeline is going to help keep all parties on the same page with responsibilities, next steps, and helping set expectations. We recommend that you schedule a reoccurring conference call with key stakeholders and parties to maintain open communication lines and to keep on top of this timeline. Initially, those calls will likely be more frequent, and as the recovery progresses, you can begin to scale those back and, and reduce the cadence of those calls. Some items to make sure you're discussing at these meetings are the current property condition, the progress of repairs and next steps, employee status, ensuring that there aren't additional questions or concerns to make sure that they are also taken care of appropriately, and any needed communication or updates with clients. The next part of this discussion is around your operational preparation and response. As a matter of best practices, we recommend you do as much of the following as possible. Review and update your business continuity plan on a regular basis, including ensuring that all key stakeholders are current, have visibility to their roles and expectations. Verifying critical vendors business continuity plans so that you know they can be in the place to respond to your needs at the right time. Evaluating the possible impacts on and opportunities for client and customer services. In the table below on this slide, we've listed seven best practice components to consider within your plan. You'll remember that we touched on some of these previously in our review of the property recovery process. Those would be direction and control, communication, life safety, property protection, community outreach when able, recovery and restoration, and of course, implementation and maintenance. On this slide, we're going to talk about a few actions and strategies we feel are important for you to consider ahead of time and to make sure that they're updated. Keep a list of one pager of important items, such as telephone numbers and contacts, and again, making sure that those key stakeholders are, are current, account numbers, uh, so they're easily accessible, and addresses as well. You also would want to consider scanning hard to replace documents um, so that you are able to, to access them um, a little bit easier when you need them at the most critical times things such as legal contracts, insurance documents, and tax returns. Keep original and or duplicate uh, records in places where they can be safe, such as bank safe deposit boxes. Off-site storage can be very helpful. Waterproof containers can also assist in those times. And when there is an opportunity, it's a great idea if you can look to partner and coordinate post-storm recovery efforts with other local businesses. It is important for you to have at least a high level understanding of your insurance coverages, and you can work with your broker as part of your regular review and update of your pre and post-storm plans. It might even be good to have this included as one of your lists or as a separate document. Here are some items to keep in mind. A high level awareness and understanding of coverages and resources you are afforded in the event of a covered loss. Your policy deductible contribution and any special provisions or other specific loss reporting provisions within your policies. Flood coverage and your property or property values. And if available, your business interruption and any relevant time relevant coverage details for the period of restoration. Lastly, we want to share a few tips and reminders with regards to some of the communication procedure strategies. We recommend that you add your insurance company's toll-free claims numbers and insurance broker's name to your emergency kit and contact list. It's also a good idea to meet with your insurers to discuss and set claims management protocols, and if available, determine who will handle the claim adjustment process. Have regular review and update procedures and responsibilities for gathering and pr procuring claim information. Ensure that key contacts are current. This list should include 
outside vendors, and resource partners. Determine if all the asset values are accounted for and accurate for any potential claims. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Laura Noterer to discuss the preparing of your home and your family. Thank you, Steve. So now I'm gonna go through the advanced preparation and what your family can do in the event of a storm. So here are some of the recommended steps to take before a storm is actually imminent. You wanna make sure that you're testing and servicing your backup generator and ensuring that you have an ample amount of fuel available. You wanna create an emergency plan by installing a surge suppression system possibly, lightning rod arrestor systems, or other protective measures to help protect your house. Having your trees trimmed back is crucial at the beginning of every hurricane season. Many times, old trees with limbs will get loose and cause many damages to the property. Inspecting the caulking around the home is really important and an easy to update function that you can do prior to hurricane season. And like Tim mentioned prior, ensuring your drains on the terraces and balconies are not clogged and that there is free flow of that water. Keeping the gutters and the downspouts clear is also an important repair process to make sure that you can prevent any buildup or flood damage. Creating a home inventory can be as simple as when our clients go around their houses with their simple iPhones or devices to record everything that they have inside their house opening cabinets, closets, and making sure that you have an accurate view of your current inventory if there were to be a claim. Understanding your insurance policy is crucial. So as my other colleagues have mentioned, making sure you have those proper limits in place before the storm season starts. Using um, some hardy native plants actually in the landscaping design around the house, we have seen help protect in a wind event any type of damage to the house. And also um, uprooting of those plants um, is less likely if they are hardy and native to the land because it's used to it. Using mulch versus pebbles because pebbles are heavier and they can cause damage in the event of high winds. You know, pruning back your shrubbery as well as the trees near the structure can help, again, preventing any type of wind damage to your house making sure there's yard drainage system that is free of debris so the water can flow freely and away from your property. Ensuring that property is also clearly marked and accessible to emergency responders. We have many clients that are in more remote locations or in the island regions of our state. And so making sure that you have all of that relayed to the emergency departments if they were to have to respond. If you live in a gated community, letting them know um, those responders are coming and uh, any type of vendors that are coming to help after the event occurs. Now fortifying your home, we're gonna talk through some of the ways that you can help mitigate your home to lessen the force of the high winds. Some of the ways you can do that are gonna be by making sure the roof is properly maintained, fortifying the roof to wall connections with clips are recommended. Um, typically homes that were built prior to 2003 have uh, toenails on them. So when you go to replace your roof, there is a simple way that those roofers can also add a third nail and that can be retrofitted to a hurricane clip, which will hold that roof um, to wall connection much stronger. You also have options to go to a single wrap or a double wrap, which is even stronger than those clips, but the clips are definitely what we would recommend as a base level. Reinforcing gable ends with a bracing system so it is more um, structurally sound there on the roof to avoid any type of wind damage is highly encouraged. Installing wind impact rated windows or shutters um, or possibly a fabric screen over the existing windows that can help uh, protect it from any type of wind damage. Installing hurricane rated doors and garage doors are also highly recommended um, to protect the home. And all of these um, items that we're mentioning so far actually are really important to get the best cost savings on your insurance. And um, whenever you are to do anything to your roof to upgrade it, change it, um, retrofitting those toenails to the clips or adding any type of hurricane protection, you definitely wanna get a new wind mitigation inspection. We also do work with several local vendors in the area that we can provide those recommendations to. The cost savings typically we see with at least one credit that's gained is saves back that premium savings in a year on your insurance policy. So always highly recommended. 
And this is a little picture here just to show you the importance of fortifying your home here in Mexico Beach, Florida. As you know, we had Hurricane Michael hit us a few years back, and this was a home that was actually still standing in that area because it was fortified correctly. Also, making sure emergency plans are in place that you can pre make preventative steps. So making sure you're familiar with your community's disaster preparedness plan, um, going through and signing up on the local emergency alert system, such as FEMA, American Red Cross has one, my radar, and NOAA. We recommend getting these all set up prior to June 1st and the hurricane season starting. Knowing the specific evacuation route in your area is very important and having a specific destination in mind. Selecting a point of contact and a common meeting place for you and your family is critical, as well as identifying a shelter room in your home if you had to stay put um, that is enclosed on the first floor and also in a central part of the home with no windows. Making sure that you identify when you're making these plans a responsible person to prepare your property and or check on the property. Especially many of our clients have homes that are secondary here in Florida and they are away during the time of hurricane season. So making sure you have an assistant or another person that is responsible here in the area that can check on your home. I'm um, having a plan in place for your family, your elderly parents, the kids that are away at college and also household staff is critically important. Creating a written hurricane preparedness plan is highly recommended. Um, going through who is responsible for what um, is very important in that plan. Maintaining a relationship with your roofer, um, like Tim was mentioning, is very important and your contractors so that when that storm occurs, when you have those claims, you already have that great relationship and you're gonna most likely be put to the first of the list. Ensuring your vehicles also have received regular maintenance. They have a full tank of gas. Um, we do see, unfortunately, as many of Floridians have lived here for so long, there's runs on those gas stations when we know a storm is intimate. So making sure you just keep those topped off um, during storm season is really important. Also contain, uh, making sure you contain a uh, sur survival kit set up in your um, automobile if you were to have to leave the state or you were stuck somewhere, making sure that that includes all of the necessary items. Um, some of the important documents that we recommend that you would include in, in your preparedness kit are going to be personal items, um, things that are harder to replicate um, after they're destroyed or lost, uh, birth certificates, marriage license, immunization records, and any type of really important memorabilia for photos that you have there are important on the personal items. As far as financial documents, stocks and bond certificates, critical account numbers, and your latest income taxes. Insurance documents to include would be copies of all your policies, appraisals, home inventory lists, and pertinent contacts. Some of the legal papers to also include would be deeds, titles, wills, passports, POAs, custody papers, and divorce records. Some of the ways that you can secure your valuables in the event of a storm are going to be considering your artwork, your jewelry, your silver, wine, furs, or any other valuable collectibles. Making sure you store those valuables in a secure location and have an evacuation plan for those valuables. Maintaining an inventory and also having a current insurance valuation for each object is highly recommended, as well as just keeping up with the, the market value appreciation of those items. We typically on the private risk end recommend clients keep a, a appraisal every two years updated for their items. And if you have a valuable um, conservator, any type of jewelry appraisal, keeping those good relationships are important so that they can help you keep those updated in those inventory lists. Making sure you inspect the conditions of the, uh, the house and engage any service providers that you might need as a conservator moving those um, special items. Um, it's really important that, especially in light of your insurance, if you do have coverage for these valuables, many of the policy contracts require you to use a licensed mover if you're going to move those items, especially artwork. So making sure you read through that contract with your advisor and understand that properly. Making a supply kit. Some of the items that you can store, we recommend most of those be in a re water resistant container. 
Um, some of the items to make sure that you have plenty of supply is going to be water. Having one gallon per person per day for the next three to seven days is really important from a drinking and sanitation perspective. Food for at least enough of those um, three to seven days, looking at items like non-perishable packaged or canned foods and juices, specialty foods, um, especially for infants or special need individuals, elderly and pets. Um, looking for uh, anything, types of snack foods that keep well, cooking tools, uh, proper fuel for those items that you're bringing to cook, and paper plates, uh, plastic utensils that are easily disposable, and two coolers, we recommend one to keep the food in, and then just another one for the ice. Keeping on hand cash in at least like a $300 to a $500 dollar various increments, um, because many times we do see ATMs lose power, they're not available, um, and it, it many times can be for a much more extended time than even when the storm passes. First aid kits, um, including medicines that are important, making sure you have at least a two week plus supply of any prescription drugs. Your clothing, include any type of water resistant rain gear and sturdy shoes. Having many flashlights available, especially with extra batteries and one for each family member. Now, since I'm just kind of following up to the COVID um, pandemic that we did have, also bringing that into consideration when you're preparing your supply kit. So things like hand sanitizers, face masks, disinfecting wipes, cleaning supplies, latex or equivalent latex type gloves and toilet paper. We did see runs on a lot of these during COVID, as you can remember, and so making sure you have plenty of this on hand in your supply kit. Having a portable NOAA weather radio and extra batteries, um, we do prefer to say using crank radios are better because that way you don't have to worry about replacing the batteries, um, but always having just extra batteries on hand for any battery po powered radios. And um, plastic tarp, really important, uh, making sure for covering any type of roof or window damage. Um, so if you know there is a damage to it, you can quickly put that up using screening, other tools like a simple toolkit, um, nails, duct tape, et cetera, any type of additional things to help um, mitigate that risk if you do have a loss. Um, general supplies we do recommend as far as um, having some sponges, buckets, towels and disinfectant if you were to have a loss and cleaning that up quickly. And um, power uh, paper towels, plastic trash bags and pre-moistened towelettes are really helpful, especially that way we can conserve water. Um, having a whistle to signal for help um, is helpful as well as um, having a dust mask to help filter any type of contaminated air, um, plastic sheeting and duct tape. Tools, including a wrench or pliers to turn off those utilities. Cell phone with chargers, inverters or solar char chargers are really recommended. That way you can keep that, that power and that communication line open, as well as a camera. Full tanks of gas and local maps in the event you need to evacuate the area are really helpful as may, our cell phones and our web internet may be down at the time. So having those um, paper maps are critical. Uh, preparing the outside of your house when the hurricane is actually very imminent and um, right at hand is to remove all of your patio furniture, any type of planters, sculptures, like outdoor decorations from the yard, and storing it inside a contained structure such as a garage or the house, um, including any large light fixtures that could come loose, sconces or ceiling fans, anything that you can think would become a projectile in the event of a storm you want to remove and take inside so it's protected. Um, tying down the large items that you cannot move is highly recommended. Securing um, fireplace dampers and flues so um, the water cannot get into the house from the chimney. Um, placing blankets around that and also using stretch wrap in front of the fireplace to reduce further damage if there were a leak. Filling your fuel supply for your backup generator like we talked about before, making sure that's there and available. Vehicles, you want to move those to a safe area, um, preferably in a garage away from trees. Um, some of the things we learned from last year's hurricanes and the prior were that many people left their cars in place at their garage. So having a contract that actually can move those out to a more higher safe place would be recommended. Um, and also, if you do park it in a garage, make sure you park it on an upper level. And we did see some people move their cars, but they still left them on the lower level. So it did it, they did experience flood damage. Um, putting up storm sh shutters thinks, seems like a common um, Thing to remember, but we do have clients that have forgotten in the past, and then they do have storm damage to the house. So making sure you, you know you paid for those shutters, make sure that you put those up properly to protect the house. 
Um, lowering the pool water levels is really helpful in helping prevent it um, accumulating more rainfall than needed and doing flood damage to the house. Moving some of your um, personal possessions away from the, the windows and the doors um, to the center of the room and covering those with sheets and blankets will help prevent any type of damage if there is an obstruction through those openings. Placing towels at the base of the doors helps with any type of flood damage. Um, elevating furniture, if possible, to a second level in the house. Rolling away rugs, um, especially I know a lot of those rugs can be um, more valuable. Um, and moving them to upper levels um, where they'll be safe from any type of water intrusion. Removing your drapes, covering um, them with actual plastic garbage bags um, and making sure they're elevated off the floor. Placing stretch wrap over the fireplace like we mentioned to also prevent any type of ash and soot damage. And closing any interior doors is really important. And now I'm gonna hand it back over to Tim Le Liberty, our Director of Risk Mitigation Services. Thanks, Laura, appreciate it. So one of the best ways I find to learn is from mistakes, but I generally prefer to learn from other people's mistakes rather than my own. So let's talk about some of those mistakes we've learned and also some of the successes. So I hit on it earlier, but taking time to have a proactive vendor management is huge. We had clients who had those relationships in place and we really saw how smooth the claims process was after a claim was filed. Others, that didn't have those relationships in place were scouring Google or calling 1-800 numbers, trying to get on a list for service. And when there's that many calls coming in, it could take days or weeks, especially on the residential side. Many restoration companies really just focus on commercial claims post-storm because those claims are generally larger and more profitable for remediation companies. So build those relationships well in advance of an imminent hurricane. Having a good, good business continuity plan is also key. Make sure you have a team of people who know the plan and can execute it, especially if you have a key leader who knows that plan and they have their own issues to worry about if they had their own homeowner's claim. So make sure you have a committee of people who know the plan and can execute on it. Understanding policies is also a lesson learned. Policies are changing often in our industry and insurance companies really aren't inclined to discuss hypothetical situations. So we, and we as a broker, we're not able to determine coverage, and that determination needs to come from an insurance company adjuster. And that can be incredibly frustrating for us and for our clients when there's new policy language that really hasn't been tested, and we have to wait for coverage determinations that take often longer than we want. We saw this in the past with some language around debris removal, spoilage, tea and green coverages uh, for our golf course clients. In past storms, we saw massive power outages but many of our businesses didn't sustain real physical damage. Some of them were surprised to learn that service interruption is not normally triggered without physical damage to your property. Then you have your name storm deductible. In many states that have hurricane exposures, you're gonna have a name storm deductible as Jill mentioned earlier in the presentation, and it's based on a percentage of your total insured value. I find it important, and some of our clients almost had sticker shock because they didn't equate what the actual dollar figure would be rather than the percentage. It's important to know what that dollar figure is and make sure that you're budgeting appropriately for that hurricane deductible. Lastly, I wanna share a tale of two restaurants. We've had two clients with similar exposure as far as the number of locations and also where they're located. One of them spent a lot of time before the hurricane season, season working on their business continuity plan. They had relationships in place with refrigerated trucks, and fortunately for them, didn't lose any food at all after the storm hit. They had zero delay in being able to prepare food as soon as their employees were able to get back to work. They also had an agreement in place uh, for to rent a food truck and were able to get out to some nearby communities who were without power. And I, I believe they also said that they uh, gave some free food away to some linemen and um, electrical workers. So that really showed some um, goodwill for them. Um, the other restaurant, unfortunately, didn't have as good of a plan and had considerable spoilage. And they admitted to us that they probably got back up and running a few weeks longer than what they should have. Um, so make sure that you're taking planning seriously. Uh, like I said before, it really is going to give you a competitive advantage. All right, to help you prepare, we have some websites with some really good information on how to prepare and respond post-storm. Some of the tools that we mentioned in this webinar are located here. And lastly, if you have any questions, 
please feel free to reach out to us at info at baldwinriskpartners.com. Thank you for joining us and stay safe this hurricane season.